this is part two. Uh, let's continue on. So we are going to try to write a program in Scala to read a grammar, a context-free grammar from a text file. Okay. Okay. And what I was saying before we the recording got cut off was that uh, in Scala there's going to be a little bit more boilerplate code that's required than what you're used to seeing in Python, which is one of the reasons why Python is sometimes taught, because there's less of that boilerplate. But there are times when Python is not the best programming language to use for a particular problem, and it's good to be exposed to other programming languages. All right, so I could have Hello world, okay, and then I can go here and run this as a Scala application, and down here at the bottom I get the output and I see hello world, okay. All right, so this is the main pro the main method. Args are going to be the command line arguments that were provided by the user. Um, so let's go ahead and create in our grammar folder where our project is located, a new file, uh, sample grammar.txt. Okay? And let's create some, some rules. So I said before that when we're dealing with context-free grammars, uh, the normal convention is going to be to write an arrow between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. In this case, though, that's not necessarily going to be helpful for us. That'll just be one more thing that we have to parse when reading the text file from disk. Excuse me. So I'm just going to make it use the convention in this text file that the first, the first symbol is going to be the left-hand side, and anything else is going to be the right-hand side. Okay. So let's say we've got an S goes to NPVP. Uh, S goes to nothing, uh, NP goes to determiner noun, verb phrase goes to verb, uh, determiner goes to the, determiner goes to a, noun goes to boy, and verb goes to walk, walks. Okay, that'll allow us two possible sentences, three, three possible sentences. The first one is the empty string, the second one is the boy walks, and the third is a boy walks. Okay, So there are three legal strings in the language specified by this grammar. Okay. All right, so now if we want to construct a grammar we're going to have to do some consideration. What types of data structures might we want to consider for this language, or for, for processing a grammar? We've been dealing with object-oriented programming in Python and in Ruby. If we're going to do some object-oriented programming here, which we wouldn't necessarily have to do. There are other paradigms that are valid. But let's start with object-oriented way of thinking. What are the things that we are dealing with in a grammar? Conceptually, what are the main types of things? What's that? Retrieving values and even S retrieving one of them. Yep, so we're going to eventually want to have, have keys and look things up, look up the values that are associated with them. Okay, but I'm, I'm thinking more uh, in terms of the types of classes that we might want to define ourselves. So we've got non terminals, right? We've got terminals. We've got rules. We've got a grammar. Okay, so let's start by creating a class 
that encapsulates the idea of a non-terminal. Okay? Would we have to do this? No, we could just use strings, but this will be a nice way of brushing up on our object-oriented programming. Okay? So I'm going to create a class called non-terminal. Okay? Now notice something immediately here. Scala is a brace language rather than a language like Python. Okay? So in Python, you don't specify the explicit beginning and end of a block of code. That's implicitly marked by the indentation. Okay? Python is an outlier in that regard. It is basically the only language that I know of that works that way. Okay? Most other languages do something like either like this or what, like what Ruby does. Okay? So Ruby allow, has class end. So it has down here, you would do end. It would look like that. Okay? So that's what a class in Ruby would look like. Most programming languages have explicit beginning and end markers to delineate a block of code. Okay? Uh, Ruby sometimes uses curly bra brackets, sometimes uses end. Okay? Scala is going to consistently use curly brackets. Okay? Scala is like that, Java is like that, C is like that, C++ is like that. Uh, I think basically all of the C family languages are like that. Um, JavaScript and its variants are, are like that. Most programming languages are like that. Not all of them, but it's certainly a very common way of doing things. Okay? So now we've got a class called non-terminal. What do we need to store? Do we need to have a member variable? Any member variables in this class? If we've got something like S or NP, and we do we want to store that? Probably. What member variable, what kind, what, what, what could we store in a member variable? Would a single character work? Probably not. We might, imagine we have a non-terminal object and we want to print it. We would want it to print NP if that's representing an NP. So we probably want to store a string. Okay? And the string is going to be the literal string that was in the text file. Okay? Now, in Python, we had an explicit init block that was the constructor for that object, for the, uh, the constructor for that class that you use to create objects. Ruby had something similar. In Scala, we're going to do something a little interesting here. And we're going to allow that to happen right here in the declaration of the class. Okay? This is where some of that happens. Okay? We can also do things down here in the body, but if we've got something that is just storing a member variable that also is going to be passed to the constructor, we can do it right here. So what do you want to call the member variable? Value? Is that fine? I'll let's call it value. Okay. Now notice a couple of things. Value is the name that I gave that member variable. In Python, you would have done something like self.value. Okay. Here I don't have to have that explicit self. Val is going to indicate that you can't change it later, that that is going to be an immutable data object, okay, as opposed to uh, mutable. If I wanted it to be changeable later, I would say var instead of val to make it a variable instead of a value, okay? If I have a val and I try to change, its, change it later, I will get a compile error. Okay? So down here, if I wanted to say value equals something else, 
I'm going to get an error because error reassignment to val. Okay, so it's going to complain at me and say, nope, you can't do that. Okay. All right, so we've got a value. Okay. Now, what if I want to print it? Should we have a print method or a, a, a conversion to string? Okay. So recall that most programming languages have a conventional way of converting an, a data object to a string representation. Okay. So in, in Python, I think this was called like underscore underscore str underscore underscore uh, in uh, in Ruby, I think it's 2s, and in Java and Scala, it's 2-string, okay? So we're going to, we have to, the, there's going to be a default string, 2-string, in the parent class of this, which is, we're not going to go into that right now, but just trust me for right now that we have to put in override here. Override def. So def is going to be a defining a function, okay, to string, doesn't take any parameters, and returns a string, okay. So ignore the override for a second, and this is going to be the general, the general format of a, of a function or a method in Scala, okay. We've got def, we've got the name, we've got the parentheses with any parameters, you've got a colon, and then you've got the return type. Okay? So this is specifying what the type is that this function returns. Don't do this in Python because Python doesn't care. Python isn't doing static type checking. Okay? Then we've got an equal sign and the curly brackets that denote the body of the function. Okay? It's complaining that I didn't put override because to string a kind of basic stupid default version is defined somewhere else in the class that this implicitly inherits from. And so to convince, to, to, to satisfy the compiler, I'm going to have to tell it to override that version and use my version instead. Okay? So now, I could do something like this. Uh, val x equals new non-terminal np. Okay? So notice what I did here. I created a new variable called x, or rather I created a new value called x. It's not changeable. Okay? But I either have to say var or val when I'm defining a new variable. And then I said new non-terminal. Okay? This is similar to what we did in Ruby, where we would have done non-terminal dot new. Okay? Here we, at, we use the keyword non-terminal. Okay? All right. Now let's print x. Okay, so we printed the non-terminal. So we created a new non-terminal. We called print line. Print line implicitly called the toString method up here, which returned value. Okay. All right. Let's create another class for terminals. And this is going to look almost exactly the same, because we want to be able to do almost exactly the same sort of thing. Okay. Now we've got two types, terminals and non-terminals. It looks the same, but they are in fact two different types. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to introduce a new concept called traits. So we talked a little bit about inheritance, 
right? Just a little bit. This is going to be similar, but in a slightly different vein, slightly different way of doing things than the inheritance that you would see in Ruby or Scala, or Ruby or Java. Actually, can you do mix-ins in? I don't remember if you can do mix-ins in uh, Ruby. Okay. So I'm going to define something called a, that's called a trait, and I'm going to call it symbol. Okay. So what does this mean? So I'm using symbol here in the sense that we used it over here. So a symbol is either a terminal or a non-terminal. Okay. Now a trait is going to be kind of an abstract class. So it's saying the types of things that something might be. Okay. So what is a symbol? Well, a symbol has to have a value that's a string. What else should a symbol be able to do? Maybe be able to do a two-string. It should be able to do have a two-string method that returns a string. And let's add another one. Uh, is epsilon that returns a boolean? Okay. So now maybe it's becoming more clear why it's called a trait. Okay. I'm specifying the types of things that something might have, but I'm not specifying its implementation. Okay? I'm saying it has to have a member variable called value that is a string. I'm saying if it's a symbol, then it should be able to have a two string that returns a string. And if it's a symbol, it should have a method called is epsilon that returns true or false. Okay? But I'm not putting a body. Associate, I'm not associating a body with these things. Okay? Although I could, for example, I could put, actually, I could put a body in toString, and that might make sense, uh, because if I have a value, then I could use it in this toString. Okay? So now I'm going to say that terminal is a symbol. Okay. It inherits from symbol. Can I get the syntax right on that? It's complaining. Mm, probably got the syntax wrong. Extends. Uh, there's another language that does it that way. Swift, maybe. Okay. So terminal extends symbol. Now it's complaining. Anybody want to guess why it's complaining this time? Because I did not define, because a symbol must declare an is epsilon method, but I didn't. Okay? So is a terminal nothing? Is a terminal epsilon? No, it's not. So I will have ips, is epsilon always return false. Okay. And now we're good. Okay. We can do the same thing with terminal. And non-terminal also is not epsilon. Okay. And both of these are going to use the two string implemented in symbol. Okay. And notice terminal defined a member variable called value, which symbol said it had to. Non-terminal also defined a member variable called value, which symbol said it had to. Okay. All right. Now there's one more thing, one other kind of symbol that we might want, and that's epsilon. Okay. Epsilon is neither a, neither a terminal nor a non-terminal. It's just emptiness. Okay. So, but we might want to have it in the grammar. A context-free grammar can possibly have an epsilon in it. So now I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to create an object. Okay. So recall from what was the second language in the book? 
after, after Ruby? IO, yes, okay. Remember in IO how you created objects directly without classes? Turns out you can do that in, in Scala as well, okay? So I can directly create an object, okay? So I'm gonna create an object called Epsilon. I'm creating an object rather than a class because this is gonna be a singleton. There is only one Epsilon. I'm not gonna to have to create multiple instances of Epsilon. There's just the one thing, okay? So object Epsilon is also going to extend symbol, okay? And because it extends symbol, it has to have a value, which is its string representation. Okay, and I will actually get out the epsilon symbol for that. Okay, and we need a method is epsilon, which is, returns a boolean, which in this case should be true. Okay, makes sense? I think this works. This works in some languages and I think Scala is one of them. Variable names are not limited to ASCII characters. Okay, which means that if I want to, I can have an object or a variable that's literally called epsilon, the Greek letter. Okay, now that's harder to type, but if you want to, you can. Whether or not that's a good idea is going to be based on the conventions of whatever group of people you're working with uh, and is often considered bad practice just because it's harder to type, but it can be done. Okay. You guys have a preference for which one I use? Which is less confusing? This one? This way? Okay. All right. Okay. So now we've got those classes. We've got the trait symbol. We've got the object epsilon. We've got the class terminal. We've got the class non-terminal. And we've got the object my program that has a main method. Now, this is a Scala convention. If you have an object and that object has a main method of this exact form, then that class can be run. Okay? Then that file can be run as a main program. Notice on the right-hand side unit here, unit basically means void in the Java or C sense of the things. So it means that it's not going to return anything it's just going to return emptiness, okay? Or rather, it's not returning something, okay? We're going to stop there. The next thing that we're going to do is create a function that will read the text file from disk, and then we will, once we've read it from disk, create some instances of these classes, okay? All right. That is all. I will see you guys next time.